Hey there, YouTube. Welcome on back with the solo RPG guy of Artichoke Dip, and we're discussing how to create a location. So, or we're just goofing off. off. Either RPG. way, you know, we're we're just we're just a couple of old guys going to have some fun, and hopefully, maybe we'll teach you a thing or two. Right, right, and so I think with and me and you have already discussed this. Like everybody has a different playing style. Everybody um, might like to pull upon a different resource. Um, and making a village, if we were to make a village for our RPG, and you had a choice of, we'll say, a couple of books to do that with, what would you, what would you go to your library first to use? If I was going to create a village, the two books that would be on the top of my list, and I know you know of both of them, is the um, Worlds Without Number book, which I showed you last week. And then, of course, you know, the other RPG that just says, grab me, is Forbidden Lands, because Forbidden Lands has all those charts in there. It's it so funny that you mentioned that. So before making this video, I had put a little pile together of books that I would use and I do use, I should say, for my RPGs, and those two are right here. Yep. The this Legends here. and Adventures from Forbidden Lands and the, yep. Yes, absolutely excellent resources for solo RPG gaming. Um, pretty much, you know what, and I know you've mentioned it in your videos, I've mentioned it in mine, and there's so many people out there, if you have not experienced Forbidden Lands yet, I'm telling you, you're missing out. Forbidden Lands. Well, that was the first RPG I came across, not designed for solo, that literally said, play me solo, play me solo. It's so easy. That one that just says screams. Play yeah. me solo. Yeah. And I, I think it was you who was telling me the gentleman that designed Strider mode for the One Ring um is redesigning basically a emulator for forbidden lands form yeah the, the yeah. they have that new kickstarter out for that realm I, I know you've got the map hanging on your wall somewhere but they came out with the bitter reach was which was the land above and now yes. if, you a, if you take a look at your map now and just turn your head to the left that area right there is supposed to be like a volcanic land or whatever and that's the I guess next thing that comes out and he's going to have rules for solo play for all of forbidden lands come out in that set whenever they finish their kickstarter well i'm gonna have to make some room in my library <laughs> yep so um now when you do your rpgs i know how i do like how i like to do mine is when i come upon a village i don't first thing is i don't like to restrict myself i like to leave a lot of open areas if I, decide, if I decide later on in the game, hey, I need a healer or I need um, a weaponsmith or I need something like that, I can always populate that area when needed and flesh it out versus just creating everything and saying, this is all that's there and this is it. And pretty much it doesn't make any sense in my RPG, but it's there. Um how do you approach that? How do you? I'm pretty much the same way you are, unless the RPG itself gives like rules for what's available in the village and what's available in the town and what's available in a you know a large sure. city. There's an off the wall game that probably no one's ever heard of called Power Frame, and in that game he actually has like you know in between each adventure, so to speak, if you're at a village. This is what's available. And if you want anything more than that, you have to make a role. Like you're looking for it. It's like hidden. It's not like out in the open. I mean, obviously the locals know who the healer is or who the blacksmith is. But if you're the new guy in town, you don't know where to go. So you're wandering around and that old hut off to the side that looks old and dilapidated just happens to be the healer's hut. You just didn't know it, but the locals do. So you have to do that, you know, charisma check to ask around. Exactly. Now, Otherwise, you're just kind of screwed. Another book, believe it or not, and I know you have this one. Matter of fact, I know you do. But it's one that when it comes to 
one of the things about solo RPG, you can use pre-published adventures if you want to. You can do all those things to get a solo experience. But really, the best way is to create your own world, set your own, uh, we'll say, parameters, if you will. Right. One of the books I still go back to to today, still one of my mainstay books, right here. Three, yep. Third edition Dungeon Master's Guide, which when it comes to world building and creation, I still think, in my, this is my opinion, I always say that, it's my opinion, but I still say it's the most comprehensive, um, detailed book in a, the most simple format that has ever been published and out there, and it works well for the solo enthusiasts as well. Yeah. I don't know if that tension when they set it up but it sure as hell works that way <laughs> yep and then one last thing that i have recently picked up and i talked to you about this a little bit and that is this is written by stephen chabot and it's called town tables this one know, yep. excellent this one has really helped um a lot with city village creation stuff like that but the, now getting into creating a village now typically would you create a village do you want a large village a smaller village which they'd call i guess a throp at that point which would be more like a farming mm -hmm. farming community yeah yeah, more of a place of a target for birding and plundering and anything, but... Right, yep, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, when it comes to my village making, it's, it, I don't worry about it until I need to worry about it, until it becomes part of the story. I mean, when, like, Forbidden Lands might give me, you know, a basic outline, and that's all I got, that's fine. And then when I come back to the village, if I need X, Y, or Z, well, then that's when the random rolls will come in to see if I got it. And, you know, if it's there, fine. If it's not there, fine. I have to, oh, well, I have a reason now to leave this village because I need to fix my axe and there's no weaponsmith here. Excuse me, sir. Where's the nearest village? How do I get to the next town? I, I Y'all <laughs> will fix this thing for me and I need this thing fixed. Right. Now, here's another interesting concept. Me and you have talked about this, and it's something to uh, get players to think about. Now, when you hear the word village in your RPG game, I think like the vast majority of people, you're thinking of this wonderful sanctuary, this place you can go that's going to have healing and food. And But what if, what if you left that up to chance or deliberately and created a village maybe that wasn't so hospitable for your characters. Perhaps something with a dark past to it that could be inhibited by uh, evils that lurk in the shadows. Been there, done that too. And that's been the times, there have been times, 10 minutes into gaming, uh, dude, you're not welcome in town. Get <laughs> No, <laughs> you've got five minutes to go before the wanted poster goes up on the wall. So now with that, with Don, like I was talking to you about, there's a lot of new people um, that are now starting to really engage with solitaire tabletop gaming, whether it be board games now that are, I mean, I think we're seeing more and more so nowadays where most of the larger um, and I'm going to say dungeon crawler type of board games you're seeing that are kind of like bridging, they're blurring the lines between board game, role playing game. But the vast majority of them are written to be played solitaire or with in a group. Yep. Almost every now, game out there. Yeah. And a lot of people now are going, well, wait a minute. You know, can you do this with RPG? Oh, absolutely. I mean, me and you are living yeah. proof of it. Exactly. And, you know, so for these people out there, they're just getting into this. They're trying to grasp all this because the one thing about solitaire RPG that, and I, and I know you try to convey this in your videos and I try to convey it in my videos. And for some people, it's very, uh, I, 
it's a fine line between not being a game master, but actually being a solitaire role player. Because there's a fine line between there, and you have to really, um, how do I put this? You have to understand when it's time to let your creative side unleash itself and really create your world and when to know when it's kind of time to back off from too many references to where at that point your game starts to become more of well as you would find like a published adventure that's not a bad thing but it does limit the solitaire experience to a certain extent i will say right. Yeah, you don't want to start rolling on a chart and then just keep rolling on a chart and then just keep rolling on a chart and then just keep rolling on a chart and not actually play and interact with it because now at the point you're are you really fellow rpging or are you now you're doing you're doing the work that a game master would do if he's getting ready for a group play and then you're not actually playing your character sheets off on the side you're too busy doodling your village or your town or your dungeon or your forest or your mountains or whatever you're getting ready to go to. It's just another role, another role, another role. No, sooner or later, you got to stop and interact with whatever that role is creating. Exactly. Exactly. Now, when we talked about this, and uh, so for those of you that know out there, um, up until last week, me and you never really talked face to face, just corresponded across Facebook. So we sat down and we had a couple hour conversation and um, got to know one another. And um, one of the things that um, I think we both touched on, we both um, agreed with, and the other thing that's going to go into the village, the whole entire thought process of the village and everything, is the NPC. And just how wonderful an NPC really is. Now, I've talked to other gamers that strictly disagree and say they think npcs destroy the game i don't like no that. um npcs don't destroy the game i mean essentially npcs are the game because yep. other than you know okay going into the dungeon and killing said orc and said goblin and blah, blah blah you have to interact with people just like in real life you can't go around Taking an axe to everyone, they'll throw you in jail and you'll we'll never see you again. Sooner or later, you got to talk to someone about something to do something, get something done. Exactly. You got to talk to the grocery store clerk just to pay in the pay, you know, get your groceries. And if she's having a bad day and you're having a bad day, and you might be arguing over the, you know, the price of a block of cheese. Well, you know what? That same kind of stuff can actually happen in a role playing game. I, you know, oddly enough, and uh, one thing I can, and I mentioned this in one of my recent videos about the NPC and what a wonderful resource this really is. And you should exploit it. You shouldn't put it to the back burner. And the fact that sometimes it doesn't matter. I can sit down at the table and go to create a character and think of this great idea for a character, roll the dice, put it together. And then after it's done, I kind of look at it and go, eh. But then I can roll a few dies on a table and I can come up with this NPC and I'm like, you know, I kind of like that idea a lot better. I really kind of, I never would have thought about um, doing it that way. And one thing, now it, it ended in disaster. Let me get this out of the way to begin with. So it's been a while since I played 5e and I decided, you know, I want to play some 5e. So I rolled up a couple of characters here. And um, it, anyways, it, it, it ended in just horrible. Uh, both characters were just killed out outright. Didn't even make it to the introduction of the game. They were just... <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, that's but, happened to me too. But the one that I really enjoyed the most was the one that um, was actually... I just rolled off of an NPC a randomized NPC looked at the archetype and said, you know what? That's kind of cool. I want to go along with that. And getting back to what we're talking with the villages and creating areas, this is one another important key factor if you're just new into solitaire gaming to think about. NPCs, they're an excellent resource. Excellent resource to help 
create your world, to help balance things out. And there's something else that's good, we're really good for. And the fact is, I one thing I hear a lot of people, and I'm sure you've been posed with this question too, Dan. So how many characters are too many characters for a solo RPG player? How many should I have? How many should I start out with? All of those things. That varies, but the act, the answer to that question is as many as you're comfortable with, because it depends on the RPG. You can get one of those, you know, super thin rules light RPGs, and yeah, you can run six or seven characters. But you pull out a, you know, a complicated game like um, I like the Witcher RPG, but there's a lot of moving parts in that one. No, I don't want to play six characters in that one. There's just too many things to keep track of. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not solo RPGing. It's an exercise in accounting. So, yeah, exactly. it depends exactly on the RPG you're playing. If you're playing one where you can handle four, five, six players, go for it. But, you know, realize the more complicated the game, the more <laughs> stuff you got to keep track of. And then all of a sudden, are you actually having fun? Or are you sitting there going, oh, my God, what am I doing? <sighs> exactly. And that all gets back to the NPC. Um, so we remember the basic D&D, &D, right? You roll up that charisma score and you're looking at it tell you this is the max number of henchmen. And for a lot of people, they'd be like, what's that? Well, those are the max number of NPCs that can be directly linked to your that personal character that they can control, dispatch, and do what they want. Exploit that people. Use that to your advantage. Just like Don was saying, if you're playing a, a RPG that's a bit more involved, a bit more, um, we'll say, sophisticated than the, a lot of other basic game systems out there, but you want more people in the party, but like you're saying, it's going to turn out looking more like a spreadsheet than a game, utilize some npcs pull those npcs in and they don't have to be characters under your control but your character at that point can delegate what they do and still it which gets back to like what we're discussing locations and what makes locations how do you create them how do you put into them um those certain aspects to make them for your game work the best, still have fun, and not be overburdened with a bunch of, like you said, basic dice rolls and spending an entire game session looking at tables rather than actually playing the game. Exactly. So that's I, I usually I usually have, I mean, at bare minimum, I try to get at least three NPCs on the table because someone has to give me the quest. Uh, usually there's a, a background friend or a mentor or something that comes into play. You know, you got to have that, that particular, you have to have the quest giver, you have to have the mentor. And then of course, you're already thinking of the big, bad, evil guy at the end. And that's usually an NPC. You may not have them written up then and there, but you at least got, you know, the thought processes going that, okay, if I'm going into this undead cavern sooner or later i'm gonna have to come across the necromancer that made it if i'm going into this cultist layer sooner or later i'm gonna run across said high priest so you know keep that in your mind sure and as as you're playing sooner or later you know especially if you use mythic or something similar introduce a new npc oh well, time to bring up an npc so you right. got another npc in the books so that's some really good food for thought Don's bringing up here. He's explaining to you, and I'm emphasizing too. So when it comes to creating your locations, I mean, when it comes to sitting down with a piece of paper and sketching in, hey, there's a building here, there's a building there, there's a building here, there's a building here, and there's a road that runs through here. You really don't need me and Don to explain that to you. Those are your own creative faculties that are going to fill all that in. You don't need to be explained to that. But what are the things that support this? What are the things that are going to help really add a good structure to this location that you created? And NPCs are definitely number one. Now, 
getting back to what if you had a village that had a more nefarious type of theme to it and you'd always don't have to rely on npcs as a matter of fact another thing um that you could branch out into and you can utilize especially in your storyline and uh making it more so than a cookie cutout template of just stat numbers are your encounters from your whether you're using monster manuals or your beast area or whatever game you're playing but really emphasizing um, one of those things. And an example I'm going to give you, D&D released uh, Volvo's Guide to Monsters. And if you read and you talk to a lot of people and they'll say, oh man, that's such a much better book than the Monster Manual. And for people who have been playing RPGs for a while, they kind of scratch their head and they're like, what do you mean? You got less monsters to deal with in your game. How can it be better? Well, the difference is the stories. They really go into these encounters. They explain the backgrounds. They explain what really drives them. And it helps people be able to integrate those into their game because it gives them that, that food for thought. And it gets them to look at it more than just a stat block. Now, at this point, these things become part of a larger story. And they have a meaning and a reason to be in that story. So there's something else there, too, that you can pull on. Don't think when I say NPC, it always has to be human or a demi-human. It can also be something monstrous as well that you could bring into, uh, you know, food for thought. How's your, how do you? Oh, yeah, I have to agree. Dude. I mean, when you're, I mean, it's a mixed bag, kind of, because when I look at an RPG, there's two things I look at. One is the rule set, the mechanics, and then one is the setting. And if you take a trip through Drive Through or Itch.io or any of those other places where RPGs are sold, you will find people selling you the setting because when you finally buy the book and read the setting, uh, the mechanic sucks. Or yeah. they'll sit there and stress the mechanics a lot and the world sucks yes. and sometimes you very rarely get an rpg where both the setting and the rules and you're like yes this is great but going back to what you're saying it's a whole lot easier if i'm reading a setting piece of setting material and they introduce an npc blah 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 and they give a little bit of a story it's a whole lot easier for me if I'm in that setting, or even if I'm not in that setting, I just want to introduce this guy into the setting I'm playing. I have a background. I have a story. I have something going on. It's a whole lot easier to say I'm bringing this guy into my game as opposed to flipping open a monster manual. It's all it's got is the stat block, and there's no background, no story, no nothing. It's just armor class, hit points, level, blah, blah, blah. Here, uh, Mr. So-and-so is the captain of the pirate ship blah 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 and he's you know selling these seas and he's up uh, you know raiding the nearby towns and it just so happens he happens to be in port and your character standing there next to him and he decides to chit chat with you and you find out oh he's looking for people to come on his ship and go you know raid nearby places and if you're playing an evil character or somebody of morals that are go either way yeah you go okay sure i got it I got an adventure story. It's a whole lot easier for me to incorporate that than it is to look at a book and go, armor class, hit points, level, name. That's it. So one system that I really enjoy and I've been playing and plays great solitaire. And it's what kind of gave me the idea for the video between us. We're talking about locations, you know, villages, stuff like that. It's this one right here. The one right now. And what really brought this up was in my adventure I had played through, I found a village and I had created it and went through, you know, and then as I entered, I had a random encounter. Now, the way it does random encounters here isn't like D&D &D where you're going to have a percentage chart that's going to break it down. You roll on a series of different... Um, features i guess you could say and uh so the thing that wound up 
chasing me through this village, you know, was this gargantuan blob type creature that had scales that was devouring everybody in its path and destroying the village, you know, and the villagers, the survivors were pretty much well convinced that it was me that brought this thing here. And on top of uh, trying not to get killed by this thing, that's destroying everything. Also the villagers that want to hang me and, um, you know, fleeing completely. So it, it was very humbling to play an RPG like like the way that it it sets those things up where it doesn't give you a description as to what you're facing. You know, hey, it's this blobless thing with scales and a bunch of razor sharp teeth and it's hungry. You know, you're like, okay, what do I, you know, how do I deal with this? But um I it really, really help break them bonds, I guess you could say, of what most people, uh, your typical fantasy trope of a village. And one of the things I, I, I have just noticed about that I loved about Forbidden Lands, too, is the fact that it gives you so many different descriptions that go into a village. It really makes every single one on the map different from one another because they're all unique to themselves rather than your standard cookie cutter, everything's the same. Yep. Yeah. On your map, boom, village, boom, village, boom, village. You know what I mean? Exactly. Where, yeah, yeah. So I, I, man, and I have to admit, that really, and when I sat back and I thought about it after I was done with that game session, I'm like, man, that was great. Even though, you know, I lost the character, the village, I'll never be able to go back to this village again, if there's any survivors left. And... You know. It happened. <laughs> I got a question for you, Rob. When between DMing a group and when you DM yourself, do you tend to be more meaner towards your just when it's just you than it is when you're with a group? Because I've seen the you know with a group, my my characters always my people survive. But when I DM myself, it's probably safe to say that seventy five percent of my games have ended in either you know TPK or the single character death. Well, you, you know it. it, it Okay, so it goes on the situation, and uh, I'll give you this example. So I had taught both of my nephews how to play D&D, &D, and um, they're only a couple years apart in age difference. So when third edition was released, and I was buying up books right and left, and I, you know, they were like, Uncle Rob, what is that? And I'm like, here, you know, I'm going to show you. So I taught my oldest nephew first, and then my younger nephew, Aaron, when he came into it and started playing, you know, and he's fumbling through it, trying to remember everything. And my older nephew um, was trying to be like, I'm the big brother. I'm wiser. I know more. And I'm like, yeah, he doesn't really know a whole lot. So I had put this scenario into his head. I said, so what you currently see is you're outside you're surrounded in this old forest. You're wearing plate mail armor. And he, he was quite proud of that armor. And I said, there's electrical storm coming in. Roll 10 D 20. And for every single one that rolls over 16, you get struck by lightning and you take 10 D 10 points of electrocution damage. <laughs> it, 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 it you're mean. Yeah, I mean, it fried his character. He was a little upset, but I had to explain to him. Um, RPG is about having fun. It's not about, you know, I, I understand your big brother. Big brother knows better. But sometimes the uncle that's uh, rolled more D20s than you could be a mm -hmm. lot more than you. <laughs> you got a few more years on your nephew. You yeah. Got a few more years experience underneath your belt. Now, and I have to, you know, there was another game group I had played in, and oddly enough, the people around the table were interesting to talk to, the game master, and I hated it. I, I, I really, really hated it. It was set in the 1920s. It was a pulp, nocturne, kind of Lovecraftian type of thing, but you never got anywhere nowhere 
the story never went anywhere. I remember the game master saying, oh, you go out the door and there's these large tentacles busting out of the concrete and grabbing people and throwing them around and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. Anyways, we're going to move on to this noise over here. I'm like, time out. The world's being torn upside down outside. And we're going to ignore all of this happening and go and investigate a weird sound we hear in the next room. He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I, I, I I'm done. <laughs> I, I cannot do this anymore. Um, so, you know, when it, I know it's kind of a long winded answer, Don, but man, when it comes to games, I think a lot of it is the person behind the game, the amount that you put into it. I really emphasize that. The difference between great gaming and just gaming, the more you put in, the more you get out. Um, and I think for a lot of people, they sit down and they see a cool book. They see, you know, something on the cover that's, you know, looks extremely high pay, high paced action fantasy. And they expect that from the minute they open up the cover and roll the first dice all the way to the end. And then they find out, well, wait a minute. It's not like that. Where did I go wrong? Technically, they didn't go wrong because not every minute can be super duper fast paced. Yeah. I mean, take, sure. any, your great, take any great movie, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Die Hard. If they were nonstop action from beginning to end, no slowdown. The movies wouldn't be good and we our minds would be sitting there fried like uh yeah you gotta have those slow points you only can you know action can only go so fast for so long before you're like whoa uh, this is getting like old hat this is like you're the that's the 88th person john mcclain is killed in two minutes he can stop killing people now and move on to the next whatever scene because you know all right, enough action. I've seen enough lightsaber fights. This lightsaber fight's been going on for 20 minutes. Come on now. You know, do something yeah. else. Yeah. You got to have those slow points. Otherwise, the fast points have no meaning. Exactly. Which, creating locations, um, covered NPCs, the importance of them, is brings me to the next thing, which is depending on how you want to make this location. What is this location... Is it going to be a sanctuary for your characters, or is it going to have more nefarious um, intents behind it? So therefore, we could go with moving further up the food chain from the NPCs, going into your protagonist or your antagonist, and how they... And now, here's one thing. If you're new to solo RPG and you're watching this, you uh, trust me. Depending, if you want to play a huge campaign, um, when I mean by huge campaign, I'm sure you've heard of this, Don. These guys talk about, oh, I've been in the same campaign playing for the last eight years of my life. I'm like, wow, oh, okay. I mean, you know, some people enjoy that. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, but if you decide you want a solitary huge campaign like this, don't shortchange yourself on just one antagonist. You can have multiple antagonists populating that world along with protagonists as well. Exactly. Which, it, it, excellent, excellent. And when you use resources like that, one thing that I noticed I really liked how they structured it, um, as a matter of fact, it's something I've been really bringing into my games lately, and that's Strider mode for the One Ring. And I I really encourage people out there, if you've never um, ever heard of the One Ring, I'm not telling you to run out and buy the RPG or anything like that, but if you get a chance to read this and to give you some of these ideas how NPCs for solitary play along with protagonists and antagonists can all come together seamlessly and work, is the way that they word it with what they call patrons. Patrons in their game being NPC, who's also your protagonist, people you go to to get your missions, to get special gear, to get special blessings, whatever. 
But the cool part is they're a third party influence to the game. So they actually seem like they are a living, breathing part, even in the solitaire experience, versus maybe using something that's not as expansive, we'll say. Like, I mean, Far Against Darkness, we'll say. Far Against Darkness, I don't think you're going to find too many patrons, NPCs, or anything else in that game. No, you're probably not. I don't even, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that like it, but and they call it an RPG, but I don't think a Four Against Darkness as an RPG. Typically no. because there's no charisma score. You can't go charm the, you know, the pants off the 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 waitress in the tavern. It's literally a dungeon crawl. It's all combat. It's basically a pen and paper version of Decent and Dungeon Universalis and all those board games we mentioned before. It's just the pen and paper yep. version of it. Which is why yeah. I like to use it for a solitaire miniature game. And, I, and people yeah. are like, how does that work out? I'm like, just use the game as it's written, but use miniatures instead. It's Exactly. <laughs> I mean, um, I know when I, I look back there somewhere behind you, you have um, Dungeon Saga. And we mentioned in our previous conversation that, um, at least as far as you're concerned, the rules for dungeon creation out of Dungeon Saga was like one of your favorites. Well, that's yes. been that has been resounding in my head for so long now that I'm looking over at my Dungeon Saga stuff <laughs> and I'm going through my RPG material. And I'm like, which RPG am I going to marry into this Dungeon Saga to create my own little board game? Because, I mean, I know Dungeon, Dungeon Saga was, you know, famous when it came out, but then as soon as it came out, it like died. No one cared about it because I guess I've, there was mixed reviews and some people didn't like the way the combat worked. And that was my hit against it. I didn't like the way combat works. So I'm like, you go find a game where I do like how combat works. Look at that for, uh, Dungeon Saga and I can create my own board game. Then I gotta, ain't got to worry about the charisma score. Yeah, they're, how they randomize dungeons, how that really, you know, you draw the next card, you don't know how it's going to be set up. And nine times out of ten, it adds more complexity into it, which I like. Um, but yeah, I have to, that was a, a brilliant system that they came up with. Uh, for that i loved it i i i uh i have the four main dungeon saga sets that they put out um mostly because like i told you um I'm, I'm, I'm a game addict <laughs> Just no other way we both it. we both suffer from game adhd yes yes um I mean, I, I can, I, if, you know, I have to keep my stuff in storage, but if I were to have my place where I can store stuff, my area would look just like the area behind you. Shelves full of books and games. And yeah, right now I'm paying for a storage facility and half of it is that stuff. And the other half is my mom's not unimportant stuff. But yeah, my important stuff is in the storage. But it, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's why I'm always trying to, and I know your attempt behind your channel is the same as mine. We're, we're trying to get the word out there, get people out there like, hey, there's this whole entire world. Like you hear everybody complaining about um, the rings of power, right? And I'm not, I don't really get, I'm going to get into the discussion about rings of power and if it's good and it's bad or any of that. That is nevertheless. But for a lot of people out there, and I'm like, man, there's all these, there's these RPGs out there you can actually create better worlds than what they do and better storylines. And, you know, and you don't have to be surrounded by 10, 12 freaking people to do it. Exactly. Exactly. So, you can make your own, you can take any, if you like the Lord of the Rings, you can take pretty much any RPG, whether it's got the Lord of the Rings IP on it, like the one ring, you can go grab Simple Dungeon Dragons, and if you want to live in the Lord of the Rings world, go for it. You can. Yep. You can go do in any world you want. It's no. Insane. Yeah, and I mean the the One Ring. I I really enjoy the One Ring, but like um anything Lord of the Rings, you know, you can really binge on it for a bit, and then you're ready to move on to something else. <laughs> And, yep. 
but um yeah absolutely man that's uh i like that don aim adhd yep <laughs> yep we we both suffer from it yeah i think um and two i'm there's i'm just stabbing in the dark here but i'm guessing you enjoy to read a lot you i do that all the time i mean literally i have my headphones on i'm watching youtube or if I'm not watching, I'm just listening to it. And I've got either an RPG book or something along those lines. And I'm sitting there reading it. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to take that and marry it with that and go sit down and give it a try. And if it works, great. And if it don't, oh, well, next next experiment. Absolutely. I mean, and with me, and I'm, I'm sure you've been you've done this, too. I think every every gamer that's been into gaming for any amount of time, we've all come across the book. The cover art looks cool, draws you in. You read through the RPG and you go, well, it's okay. I don't foresee myself really being that interested, but I'm glad I read it. It was mm -hmm. a cool, at least, you know, and I, I, I bet to wager, unless you just got into gaming and bought your very first gaming system, that you have a couple of these books on your shelves that you've experienced the same thing. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, Fantasy Age, I'm going to use this one. Yeah, it was, It. I went through it, I played it, it was cool at first, but then it just lost its interest. You know, getting... I, I know exactly, I have Fantasy Age, I got the four main books for it, I played it. My problem was combat took forever. Yes. I mean... It, you're fighting that lowly goblin between the high hit points, the armor values, and everything else. When I mean, you take all that into account, it's like, all right, round 17, and I'm still fighting this stupid goblin. If you just. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it strives a little too hard to be a little too action sequency, describing every single little maneuver your character does in combat. And I mean. Right. But I mean, the stunt points that they incorporated that was like a cool idea but i think you know chop down some of those hit points or lower the armor value or something because like i said combat took forever and that was one thing that took me off now i'm glad i got the game because like you said every time you read it you learn something a little bit newer and every little piece of information you got rattling in your head helps you become a better gamer yes whether yeah. you're doing solo or with a group absolutely i mean and if you think about it it sounds like with you. you i'm guessing you probably started out the same way um i'm guessing you came into rpgs about the time the original basic D, &D red box yep you know everybody and uh i i know for me it was that original introduction where you went through you played the game it was like here we're going to show you how to play the game you read this you do this and you do that but now go and find this big group of people and help you. And I'm like, why can't you just do it like that? You just showed me how to play it solitaire. And now you expect me to go get a big group. So, and I think it's cool because I think uh, it, it, little did they know, I think at that time that there would be a YouTube internet and people like me and you <laughs> out there going, yeah, you don't need a big group to play. This is all you really need. Yep. Go grab you a cheap RPG. Go grab you a, a cheap emulator. I mean, like when I said when I started my channel, you and Geek Gamers were like the only game in town when it came to solo. Now, if you do a solo RPG search on YouTube, you'll find like fifty or sixty channels. Yes. And yes. not to mention, you know, how many. When we were talking last week, when I showed you drive through RPG, just that one guy, all the different solo emulators. Yep. Yep. There, and now, it, now, now we have information overload as opposed to not was nothing. Now there might be too much. I mean, look at our collections. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And well, and two, and the other thing about gaming um, I've noticed is it's like, and I, a lot of it has to do, I know it has to do with the internet. You got Amazon, you got eBay, and you got everything else. We have so many options now. 
that we never had before. You know what I mean? Um, it used to be you walk into a game store, you find D and D. If you're lucky, you might find a supplement by a um, independent publisher. You know, but those were very few far, and far, few and far between. Now yeah. you can on the eBay or whatever, and you're just like inundated. You don't know where to start. And, exactly. Uh, I mean, like you were showing with me, I didn't know about World Without Numbers until you told me and said, "Here, check out this link." And I'm like, "Holy crap! This is an awesome game. This is really great." Yeah, exactly. You can't, you know, like I said, like you said, back in our day, we had to go to the gaming store or to the bookstore. And hope they had whatever it was you were looking for because you heard, hey, the new book's coming out sometime this week, and you're hoping the store got it. And if the store got it, you had to hurry up and snag it before the next person got it. And but whatever they had on the shelf, that was that was it. If you want, like, okay, while we were playing D and D, they were playing Tunnels and Trolls in in England. They were playing Dark Eye in Germany, and they were playing I forget what they were playing in Sweden. No way back then could you have got your hands on tunnels and trolls unless, you know, that store happened to have that one copy of tunnels and trolls. Now, all, all, you, all we have to do is mean you mention an RPG, and I guarantee you whoever's watching our videos going, oh, let me go look at that one. Yeah. You know? oh, absolutely. Um, in, like recently, I've seen, uh, and I'm sure you've heard about this too, because what they were playing over there and – uh, Sweden was uh, Dragon's Bane. Is it Sweden or somewhere yeah, over I... there? Yeah, somewhere. I can't remember exactly that. Free League Publishing is going to soon be releasing, and I was kind of like, okay. Uh, it, it... Of course, I'll probably I'll pick it up um, sooner or uh, later. I'll probably get it too. Yeah, I'm not kidding myself. Um, I mean, for the most part, Free League has put out some good stuff. They got Forbidden Land, which both both, both of us like. Um, I know a lot of people like the Morkborg. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and there's a yep. Plus, Good aren't one. they aren't they the ones that are pumping out the One Ring? Yep. 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 So I mean, yeah. They, uh, most Free League at least is one of those companies that do it right. At least when they put out something, they put out a quality product. Now. And I have to say, so I just picked this up. This was just released on the 1st of October. And I pre-ordered this one. And now, there's something to show you. The difference between the published adventures and the level of work that goes into it and solitaire play. So this is really cool. This is something that's going to take me a while to get through. Um... I'm going to probably be able to play this many and many times over and, um, you know, depending on how I want to play it, maybe never even leave the city that they give you in there. Mm -hmm. If you can see that. Yep. Yep. Now, right there. Right there. You're, you're perfect. Yep. And so, okay, cool. Fair enough. You see how, like when I was getting back to me and you were talking about earlier, how solitaire play so the city is essentially designed. The buildings are all there. You can go in and change stuff if you wanted to and add your own little touch to it um, if you decide. But for the most part, well, according to the map, it's done. Whereas a solitaire RPG, you can make it larger, smaller. Um, it's not set in stone until it's set in stone. You can do whatever you want. Yes. And that's the thing I, I have to admit. I I really love about solitary RPG versus playing in a large group. Um I I, I just find um myself I and I don't want this to sound wrong, but I, but I don't know how else to put it. Playing in a large group, I get bored quickly. Um I, feel I, had, a, I had watched one of your interviews and in your interview with whoever it was you were talking, you said that the more you play solo, the harder it is for you to play in a group just because as a solo player, you're always used to doing something. 
But if you're playing with a group, now it's like, all right, I got to wait for him to make his the hit roll and roll his damage up oh, next player and then next player. Oh, oh, finally I get to do something. I was, yeah. I was, um, I, I, that hit with me though, when you said that, because it just so happened that pre pre 2020s, you know, that year of hell, we all had to go through. I oh, was yeah. at the gaming store and there was a group of people playing Pathfinder and I, I just literally walked by and I saw the combat set up and literally in like three seconds, the, I had played out the entire combat in my head. I already knew because I, I was familiar with Pathfinder. I was able to look at their character sheets enough to see what level they were. I could tell just by, you know, how they were talking, what their, you know, play education level was. And I'm like, you know, that barbarian's going to be dead. That mage might survive. And, um, yeah, that, that fighter, he's going to be knocked unconscious. And then, I, of course, I went and played. I was playing a, a miniature war game with a buddy, and I was keeping an ear out. Sure enough, I was right. <laughs> On all three all three guesses, I was like, yep, I already – because when you play solo and you got all those RPG elements and, you, you know, you're somewhat good at math, you can figure almost everything out even before you roll the dice. You yeah. play it long enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's um... – it's funny. Uh, I've seen so many comments on my YouTube page over the years, too. Um, I'm, and the one that sticks out, the guy says, hey, cool content, but I'd rather stick to computerized games because all this work's done for me and I don't have to do anything. And I'm like, okay, one way of looking at it. I mean, if you want to restrict yourself to... Um, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I get what the guy's saying. You know, I, I played the Morrowind and the Sky in the Skyrim and all the other games, but like we discussed, yeah, the story's already pre-planned for you. Your only choice is when you go talk to the NPC is those three or four selections on the right on the discussion tree, and, and that's it. If you want to do something different, you can't. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I, designing a location, Don. So I, I think we talked quite a bit about importance of NPCs, how to bring your protagonist, antagonist, um, you know, filling in little details like what's in the shop, and what's all that. You're going to use your randomized tables for that. Um, would you approach uh, a village or you approach uh, a new location on a map? Um what is your like your initial your first steps that as a solitaire gamer like i said it depends on the rpg but in most cases i'm either going to worlds without number or i guess i could say scarlet heroes because scarlet heroes is like a thinned down version of worlds without number they were both written by the same guy but yeah i'm gonna get at least start making those initial rolls to give me that initial feel of what I'm looking at and then I'm just going to roll with it like as if I was what the way I do my solo is I pretend that I'm actually talking to a group of people even though there's no one here because I've been both a DM and a player and what are we doing as we're soloing we're DMing and we're playing so I would at least set up what I would tell my audience and then I'm going to stop make that click in my head to switch to player mode. Okay, what am I going to do? And then figure it out from there. Cause basically that's what we're doing. We're, we're figuring it out. We're hacking, we're taking a game designed for people supposed to be sitting around the table and we're playing solo. So we're hacking the game up. We're basically oh. making it our own the whole time. So just because I do one thing one way, doesn't make it the right way. Like I guarantee you, all the RPGs disappeared off the planet, but one. All the emulators on the planet disappeared, but one. And you put me and Artichoke Dip in the same room and go, here's your RPG, here's your emulator. You two go off in your separate rooms and play for a couple hours and then come back and have a conversation. I guarantee you, whatever Rob did to NPCs, traps, all the questions we've had throughout the years, how'd you handle this, that, and the other thing, you're going to get two separate answers because it's Rob's playing his game, and I'm playing my game. We might cross paths every now and then, but for the most yep. part, we're... Yep, and I, 
so it's like i i agree with that that's the cool thing about the solitaire experience is it's so detailed to specifically you and you alone and not in a group experience um I think one of the more rather confusing things I had ever seen in my life, and uh, this was before my daughter was born, or yes, it was before my daughter was born, and me and my wife had gone out for breakfast, and we went to, uh, we're sitting in a restaurant, and we had ordered our meal, and we're waiting, and so the whole, whole other half of this restaurant were people, and my wife's like, I wonder what's going on. And we realized they were playing D and D, but it was this huge group of people. I mean, the whole side of the restaurant, right? And when I was sitting there, and I'm going, my God, how confusing is this actually? Okay, what of a logistical nightmare for the game master to keep track of all this? Um, now we're not talking about an adventuring party. We're talking about a freaking army going into a dungeon here. So, I mean, pretty much anything that's, you know, is going to be annihilated that's in your way. It's just, yeah. and I was like, how can this be fun whatsoever? And you could tell by the looks on some of these people's faces, it wasn't. And, um, you know, long before YouTube and all that, and it really, really sank into me at that moment. I'm like... You know, I'm so glad I play my RPG solitaire and I don't have to. I mean, this is just I'm, I'm thinking, how are any of these people actually having fun? But who knows? Maybe they had the time of their life. Um, I but, mean, sometimes it happens and sometimes. Yeah, I've been on that end. Like I said, I, I'm used to playing in a group. And when I was in Jacksonville, North Carolina, outside the military base, it's probably safe to say I had the biggest gaming group or at least the most popular the internet was still young. It wasn't less, you know, there was only one gaming store in town and on, on their little display board, they had, you know, my name, contact this guy, he DMs, blah, blah, blah. And we were playing at my real estate office on Sundays because that was a great place. The real estate office is closed. It had that, you know, all the things you'd want for a gaming room, big conference table, easy access to the bathroom. We're in the middle of town. Hey, take a 15 minute break. Someone can run to McDonald's and get food and whatever. But yeah, when all that comes together, now I forgot where I was going. I just derailed myself. What was I talking about? Um, oh yeah, because I had that one sign out there, 22 people showed up to play on one Sunday. Holy cow. <laughs> I was like, uh-uh, mm -mm. I yeah. am not running. We could have fit 22 people in the room. That was no problem. But no, I am not DMing for 22 people. Y'all break it down. Six to, there's, hey, you know what? You're a DM and you're a DM. You take six people, you take seven people, leave the rest here with me and we'll be good. You know, and the funny thing is I could say playing in the game group. Um, so I had seen a post. We used to have a pretty cool game store out here by me. Uh, it was like five minutes from the house, but it closed down. And they had, like what you're explaining there, they had different conference rooms you could rent. And they were doing a Pathfinder RPG. So I was like, yeah, I play Pathfinder, you know. And um, so anyways, make a long story short, uh, these guys had talked it up for two weeks. And we finally got there. And, um, you know, playing through the path, I, I was so bored out of my mind. Because... Everything went from one encounter to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Nothing, you know what I mean? And I was just like sitting there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then the TM goes, oh, we come across the bugbear. We should destroy it so it doesn't go to the village. I said, or maybe we should maim it, piss it off so it does go into the village and we could sit back and be entertained for a while watching it. And he's like, what? He goes, are you serious? I'm like, why not? It's an RPG. We can do that. Oh, no, no, no. Not my RPG. And I'm like, okay. So we're just back to literally rolling dice. Nothing else. He was just railroading you through his story, through his encounters, one right after the other. Yeah. 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 
it was it was pretty funny. So when it came to my turn, he asked me what I was going to do, and I said, "I do nothing. I'm going to see if the owl bear rips my character's head off." <laughs> Anyways, um, wow, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty certain we could go on about this for hours and hours and hours and hours. But yeah, the whole idea was for us to uh, make a starting location. I think we deviated from that like fifteen or at least thirty minutes ago. Yeah, <clears throat> well. The Not, starting, I mean, I think that, uh, starting location. I mean, the the whole scope of this thing uh, that we're trying to approach. I, I think I'm saying this for the new new gamers getting into solitaire. Is don't overutilize resources. Um, as a matter of fact, kind of look at them like salt and pepper, lightly. You know, put that over your game to add some flavor to it, but don't depend on it too much, or you're going to become, like, like you that. said, a, a damn spreadsheet, a logistical nightmare. Um, think out of the box when it comes to your locations. Don't don't feel as if you have to be restricted by cookie cutout examples that they give you. Um, at, this is fantasy. Anything can go anything um it, quite literally the only thing that holds you back is your own imagination exactly i mean so uh, now what were some pointers that you would give some new people if they were to ask you hey so i gotta create you know i come to this area my rpg where i now found this village i gotta create the village where do I start? How do I do it? Um, how do I know I'm doing it right? Which the is best the piece of advice that I've heard has come out of the World Without Number book. Do I need this? If it's not part of your story, don't create it. I mean, just because the village has 80 people in it, you don't need to create 80 NPCs. The only no. NPCs you need to create are the ones you're interacting with. If it's got 50 different businesses, uh, you don't got to make all 50. Just make the ones you're dealing with. I mean, I don't even draw maps. My villages are on a piece of paper, village name. Here's the important NPCs. Here's the important places. Sort of like when you read um, anything out of, uh, you know, from Wizard of the Coast. They give you the name of the place and a little short blurb of important people, places, and things. That's all I have. I don't, have, I don't even draw a map. Unless I'm drawing on a hex map, and then I just put a little star that says, okay, village of blah, 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 blah. I don't, you know, I don't need all the extra stuff. I don't need a cool map because, okay, one, I can't draw for crap. So if I do, I'll just go online and make one. But then it's like, okay, it looks cool, but I don't need it to play. I can visualize in my head what the map looks like. So just give me, I mean, 99.999% of this whole solo experience is taking place right here. Exactly. I mean... Exactly. Rob can describe the place that he's his character is at, and whatever he's thinking is in his head is going to be different than what I what I come in my head. So yeah. I mean, it's, as long as you're stimulating those brain cells up there, that's all you need. Everything gets documented in one of these, and I can flip back to it and jump right back into my story when I am ready to jump right back into it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, now. And I know the way that I play solitaire is different from a lot of people. Um, like I said, I've been accumulating minis and stuff for quite a long time. Um, I like my miniatures and be able to set up my 3D terrain. Now, and let me get this out there, because I think a lot of people think I play my entire solo RPG with 3D terrain. And no, no, absolutely not. 90% of it takes place up here. My miniatures are there for the combat. Because I want a more, as a solitaire player, I like a very tactical type of combat. Yeah, you want to be able to touch and feel and move the stuff around. It, it, exactly, exactly. And for some people, they may not like that. They may like the high fantasy um, where, you know, we're going to use Legolas as an example here, where your character runs in and he jumps over a table and he does about 30 you know, backflips through the air and then lands and shoots an arrow and takes out four orcs at one time. 
sure it's possible but it kind of um i would rather like to leave that in the peter jackson films for what it is and have a different experience for myself exactly yeah but, I'm, I'm like you i mean i don't always use miniatures but I will use miniatures when it's important. Uh, obviously, if I'm playing a solo game, and when I say solo, I'm only playing one PC, I probably don't need to worry about so much all the fancy dancy terrain. But if I got a party of four, and you know, Ranger Dude's moving over here, and Mage is moving over here, and the fighter's moving, for, like, okay, I might want, I need some point of reference. And so then, when the wizard throws that fireball, did he hit the fighter? <laughs> did he hit the rogue? I need to know all that, but. If it's just me, one dude, I usually don't need the miniatures because I can usually just draw a little grid, tic-tac-toe grid on a piece of paper and just mark where my person is. And that's a whole lot easier than, oh, I got to drag out all that stuff again. True, true. Yeah. Um, I have to say, for me, a lot of my games are mini-based. I play a lot of board games. Um, like I said, that kind of blur the lines between RPG and board games that are more miniature heavy. So um as i say that as i look across my table and i just see miniatures scattered everywhere <laughs> well before i moved down here to help my mom i was living alone my dining room table was always set up and at that point yeah i was using miniatures all the time i didn't have to put anything away it was a whole lot easier to walk by and be like oh wait i got 10 minutes to kill before i get it you know cook dinner or whatever let me sit down and play the next scene or or if i'm in the middle of a fight finish you know the next couple rounds of that fight and write down my notes all right go cook dinner i got my 10 minutes are up i just can't do that now but if i could i would i, I couldn't i mean i'm thinking you got me thinking back to um the old days where it, it, it would believe it or not started this um was when my wife said, you need your own space to take this crap and get it off of my dining room table was uh, Hero Quest. Not Hero Quest, but Hero Escape, sorry. And um, when at, at that time of my life, uh, a couple of my friends, they also enjoyed it. They owned the sets. We'd get together, and they'd sometimes come over to my place, and I always had this huge battle map. And you know, if you played Hero Escape, it takes a long time to set up these battle maps. So once you get them set up, you don't really want to tear them down. It's easier just to leave them assembled in one place. And uh, I, I just remember my wife and uh, her looking at it going, I am sick of mm -hmm. seeing your battle map on my dining room table. She's like, you need another place to put this crap and get it out of my dining room. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, man. Wow, I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah. Well, anyway, people, uh, we were trying to teach you how to do location, but we went off the subject. So, you know, we're just going to, we're like two old guys hanging out, just chit chatting. So, but yeah, it's very, you can do whatever you want in your solo RPG the way you want to do it. Just because Absolutely. Rob says something or I say something, we're not the, we're no. not the only, we're not the go tos. No, no. Um, it's funny. Uh, the thing about, like I say, and I've said this before, I know you said it, and I'm going to reemphasize it. There's, when it comes to solitary RPG, find an RPG system that you like because you like it. Don't play an RPG system because it's a fad, because it's what other people are doing, unless you really enjoy it. And at the end of the day, if you're having fun with that RPG, it's the right RPG for you. Because obviously it's doing its job. Um, I, I have to, you know, that's one thing I I have to say. I got to get this out. Now, when it comes to gaming, um, one thing, one pitfall I'm going to say to watch out for, it's prevalent. Um, it affects everybody in gaming. And that is fad gaming. Fad gaming being this game just came out. It's the best game. We're going to commercialize it, endorse it, talk about it, get it out there on social media. 
get everybody telling you it's the best RPG ever. And if you own this book, you'll never play another RPG. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Well, well like we, we already discussed it. Dungeon Saga. I mean, Dungeon Saga, me personally, I, I only bought it because I wanted the tiles and I wanted the miniatures and that kind of stuff. The actual mechanics did nothing for me. I wasn't wild on the mechanics. I would rather they'd done a different route with the mechanics, but well, the, trust me, when Dungeon Saga was coming out, every YouTube channel was saying, go buy Dungeon Saga, go join the Kickstarter, go do this, go do that. And what happened? It came out, and then no, you don't hear about it no more. And that same story goes pretty much along with every other Kickstarter out there. And I, when I had looked at the story behind that, so Mantic... Those were the former employees of Games Workshop when I did Hero Quest. The original people that worked on Hero Quest that had decided to go out and they wanted to basically do another version of Hero Quest, get it out there for the people. They really anticipated it to be um, really welcomed by the Hero Quest uh, people out there that were going to engage in it and it was going to take off. And then they kind of soon found out because I mean let's let's face it here. I, Hero Quest is an okay game, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate over saying, "What do you mean it's okay? It's an okay game. It's a dungeon crawler board game. I mean, that's really all it is." Um, is it an iconic board game? The original one? Does it go back? Sure, a lot of people remember. I think it brings up a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. But at the very, very basis, it's just a basic board game. Um, same with Dungeon Saga. And the reason why I got into Dungeon Saga was I was like, okay, cool. Here's something I can get into. I can get a set. I like it. It's a dungeon crawler. Like with you, you get these tiles, you get these minis and stuff. But it's not going to break the bank. Because at that time, you know, if you looked at Hero Quest on eBay... I mean, to get a rundown used copy was like five, six hundred bucks. I'm sorry. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? No. Um, before making this video uh, today, it, it's kind of funny you break that up because I was looking to see if they released anything new for Dungeon Saga. And they got some expansions out there. But I was just looking at eBay and, and like one person is selling an empty box, just a box. Nothing inside of it. $40. For a cardboard box that says Hero Quest. I'm like... No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that guy's been smoking something. I don't know what he's smoking, but he needs to share it with the rest of us because well, it must be some good stuff. Because 40 bucks for a box. An empty box with nothing. An empty box. Yeah, I guess if you had the game and not the box, I'm like, that that's beyond me. So Dungeon Saga for me was a way to kind of expand. I mean, I got Hero Quest right here. You know, once a year I pull it down and set it up and play it. And I'm like, yep, it's still the old Hero <laughs> Quest I remember. Um, but uh, I did like Dungeon Saga for the fact that, like I said, that random dungeon generation in there just takes it to a whole new level for solitaire play it really oh, yeah, i'm going to create my own little board game and i'm going to be using those dungeon saga tiles oh I, yeah i got ideas running through my head now matter of fact uh i spent at least a good hour on drive through rpg going through looking through all the various rpgs that run my wish list saying can i convert that to something i can put on the dungeon saga board that would be relatively easy so I could handle playing, you know, four, five, six characters, however many I want to play, Tip, obviously at least four, and run with it. I think I may have found the game. I have to give it a test run or two, but I'll have my own board game. I don't need to worry about going out and buying Hero Quest or the next Dungeon Saga or Gloomhaven or Dungeon Universalis or all the other zillion of dungeon board games. I'll just make my own. I got enough pieces, parts. I'm sure between what you got behind you, if you wanted to, you can create your own game. Well, that's the the thing. Yeah, absolutely. That um, that kind of I, I laugh at when I see this today, and 
for a lot of people getting into gaming, or I can imagine we're they don't know where to start because they're like I said, there are so many options out there. But I'm going to use D and D as an example. They keep coming up new additions, new additions, new additions. Um, and you know they always push this is better than this, and this is better than that. And I'm like, truth be known, third edition Forgotten Realms campaign setting is good, but I thought the original A D and D was better. Um, and then if we look at 5e, they didn't even release a campaign setting for 5e. I don't know. I haven't been keeping up with 5e, so I don't know. So, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I sit back and, you know, you hear so many people complain and they go, oh man, they don't have, and I'm like, people, why can't you just pick up an older edition and convert it? And convert it. It's the same game. I mean, that's yeah. There's not much difference between third and fifth edition, anyway. I mean, no. Now you, if you got, if you got more than two working brain cells, you can convert third edition to fifth edition and back and forth. I mean, yeah. if you got any gaming experience, you should be able to do it. And it's, I, mean, I know you can, or you've probably done it. You probably can take any RPG out of your arsenal, anyone, and yeah. put it in any setting even if that setting's from a completely different game, and run with it. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's one of the things, like me and you, we got a, a really good understanding of being solitaire players. And one thing, um, you know, depending on, I guess, how your gaming engagement is, if you're just strictly player, and you're one of them people where you only have the player's book, and that's it, because... You know, opening up that DM's guide might melt the eyeballs right out of your skull and ruin the gaming experience for the rest of your life, which is not true. Um, yeah, we look at that. We have that unique perspective where we sit and we think we go, you know, I, I, I like this. It's okay. But, you know, it'd be really cool if I could take, hmm, let me see. What if I was able to take some of the ideas out of this ruin bound over here? and put it into an RPG with this, and then I can add this into it. Okay, I know how to do, you know, I can do that relatively quickly. Where, yep. you know what I mean? I, so, I, I do it all the time. And, yeah. And, and truth be known, it's probably how the majority of the new games get out there on the market is from people just sitting around with a few game systems that they've played so many times, they're bored with, and they're looking for something fresh and new. Yep. I mean, um, Simba Room. I don't know if you heard of that one. Another free league game that, you know, does, did real good Simba Room. I have played that Simba Room setting in at least four, maybe five different RPGs. No. Same, same that, setting, but I'm using different rule sets. Five different that, rule sets. Now, that's one I've been, I have not gotten into yet. I've been looking at it, reading some of the, um, comments on it and the thing about the amazon reading their comments and looking at it i don't know how truthful they are because it always seems like every comment you read this is the best thing i've ever bought and you know i but it's kind of your perspective and i'm not trying to derail the video or anything but um how would you rate that for a solitaire experience and for for a solitaire experience, I'm going to give it a relatively high grade on the account that just like Dungeon World and the Cypher system and a few other things, all the roles are player facing. So that whole DM rolling dice, if you're rolling dice as a DM, it's because you're using Mythic or something else outside the game. Number two, typically... I have a tendency to avoid the D20 roll low game because the way the math works out, if you've played long enough, combats again take forever as opposed to lo way longer than the D20 roll high. That's what it, uh, so, but at least in that game, they at least fixed it where instead of me rolling and then the DM rolling, my role is only adjusted by what the, the bad guy is. So it's not like it's, I have to roll low, and then he has to roll low, and it's all these rolls. No. So it plays real quick. The problem is, and this is the biggest hit against that game, is, is the, the setting is so confined. 
you're literally sitting, you know, you got one major city and you got a bunch of little ones, but you have one major city on the edge of a forest. And the whole thing is you need to go out and investigate this forest because that's where all the old ruins and the world of yesteryear was. And you're going to go out there and uncover all the secrets and all the magic and all the items and all the stuff that's out there. So in that perspective, if you're looking for a large campaign, it's not going to be your game. But for a soloist, if you're especially if you're brand new and you can't think of anything, well, then you got your story already made. You're in city. They want you to go out and find said ruins. There you go. There's the first part of your story. Now grab your mythic or whatever emulator you got to fill in the details and you're good to go. That kind of reminds me of um, the way you explain it a lot like Blades in the Dark, where you, you know, you're in the city of Dustfall. And there's this whole entire city and influences and everything that you can go about and adventure, but you can't go outside the city gates because if you do, you're going to die. Not as bad, but close enough. Yeah. It, it, like I said, the campaign is real condensed. It's not like, you know, well, what happens if you go off the map? Well, you better be creating your own stuff because they don't have any to support it. It's literally the, the, the city, this big open forest. Oh, and yeah, and there's some mountains behind here, and the mountains really only play part as far as the, the backstory is concerned. But yeah, most of the adventuring is leave said city, go out in woods and find whatever. But I will say, I will say this, out of all the games I've ever played, that was the one game that I had my best solo experience in. Because when you're staring at that artwork, the artwork is so great, it kind of pulls you in. And of course, it's one of those dark fantasies where you have to worry about every little thing, especially your people getting corrupt. Low on supplies, low on hit points. The mage is on the verge of corruption. I'm being, I'm being chased by somebody. I found the ruins I was looking for. I just can't get into them because there's another camp of rune raiders sitting in front of it. I was literally, I physically was sweating bullets because I was like, oh man, what do I do? I mean, I got... I, I got, I'm being chased. I got no, I, you know what? Let's go in here. And I try, I went to advance toward the uh, guys, the uh, other room goers and try to get rid of them so I can go in there and get the loot. But my mage turned corrupt and destroyed the rest of the party. And I, you know, TPK, but boy, up until that moment, I physically was sweating bullets because I was drawn into the game. I mean, like we said, it's all in your head. Well, the, rest of the world did not exist for me. <laughs> Something else, too. Um, so I think we could both agree on here. And the fact that a lot of it has to do with the quality of RPG you're playing. Um, Free League Publishing uh, has quickly become my favorite new publisher. Everything I have played, they have hit it out of the park. It is excellent. Um, 5e, do I mind 5e? No, realistically, if I wanted to play d and I want to go... I want to go old school. I want to go back to, you know, third edition. I love third edition. It's still my favorite edition of all the D&Ds out there. Um, but the difference is the quality of the game. And, I, you know, the experience, as you're saying, sweating the like bullets. Yeah. The one ring really does that for me. And the fact that uh, the shadow, like you were saying with corruption, the ever-encroaching shadow that's constantly plaguing your characters and decisions you have to make to her, and the artwork that just draws you in and everything else to it. Those are all hallmarks of a great fantasy RPG, what fantasy RPG gaming was meant to be. And unfortunately, what we're seeing with the gaming industry, I blame Kickstarter for this. I really do. And that's the over-commercialization of everything to the point to where it's now, the way I'm kind of viewing uh, Free League Publishing is they are still more focused on what gamers want. Whereas if you look at other systems out there and they're more focused on how many books, how many supplement books can we sell you, you know, to make another record profit year. Yep unfortunately but i digress <laughs> yeah we've been digressing this whole re video so which i think uh that's okay because yep. 
our viewers, I think a lot of them have been waiting quite some time for this. And, yep. you know, that's okay because uh, that's what this is about. It's about exactly. like-minded people enjoying the same hobby, different perspectives and views on it to be able to, um, you know, get out there to the people. Especially now, in the current day and age we are living in, where, um, it, you know, it just seems like the world is rapidly falling apart pretty quick day by day. And uh, instead of, you know, marinating in just bad news after bad news after bad news, try picking it up a RPG instead. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You hit the nail right on the head absolutely people and, and hey you never know um i i will tell you what it's uh I, i'm trying to think if i didn't have rpg right um if i had to chose that day when i was a kid to go to the bookstore with my dad and see that display with them red boxes with the dragon and the fighter on it. And, uh, you know, how would things, man, I couldn't imagine. I just could not imagine. Um, Same here. I mean, our RPG is more than um, a game. I mean, it is a game to me, but it's almost a lifestyle for me as well. It's, uh, you know, I think a lot of people... <laughs> it, it, it might sound funny um you know when i'm at work if i have to swing a hammer or something like that i'm thinking yeah you know <laughs> i got a plus two hammer of uh, <laughs> i'm gonna kill it and just pretend this thing is a freaking work <laughs> you know I, mean? I, I, I don't know i'm, I'm kind of getting off uh well sometimes i do that too maybe not as often as you do but every once in a while yeah i feel that you know, and, and it's kind of cool because it, it it is very cool. It means we, in our age, okay, we still have active imaginations. Um, and that's the, I think the one thing I, I, I've expressed in my channels, and I'm, I know you do too, you were just talking about it, you're saying it's all up here, your imagination. So to kind of wrap this video <laughs> Up as to where we're starting with, you know, when if you're starting out, you're new, and you get to a location on your map, and you want to put a village in, or a castle, or whatever else it is, don't rely 100% on a random table and the result of a dice. Sometimes the best tool you can utilize is your imagination to really bring it to life exactly again nail on the head <laughs> <laughs> don't let the tables control you you control the tables so we've been going on almost an hour and a half here now which uh, i'm hoping most people make it through to the end of the video if you do, um, you like the video, click the like button. What this does is it's going to funnel more gaming content your way. And if you're new here, you just stumbled upon the channel. This is Artichoke Dip. And then, of course, you have Donald, the solo RPG guy who also has his channel. Don't forget to click the subscribe buttons on the channel. It's followed by the bell icon. When we upload videos, you're going to get a notification so you don't miss one. And with you know the way youtube works we're just raindrops in an ocean yep of... exactly so, so every little bit helps every little time you hit the like or hit the subscribe it helps our channels out immensely so it click does. on his link and then come over to my channel and click on mine absolutely absolutely all right um and with that my friends um I think this is where we're going to end this one off and until the next video and uh, we'll try to keep on point on the conversation. <laughs> we'll try. We're just a couple of old men. We'll try. Our brains are gone. <laughs> Who are you?
Yeah, we'll try to stay on topic next time. Actually, if we can figure out the technicals, we'll probably do like a live and doing like a open your open questions and answer your questions because you know sometimes it's hard for you guys to watch us and we're just telling you stuff and we're not telling you what you want to know. You can ask us and then we can tell you. Sure, and it, that's one of the. Uh, it's hard to answer everybody's question. I think exactly maybe to their satisfaction. Um, and the thing is that I've always stressed, uh, if you pick up an RPG, the one thing I will tell you, and I'm sure you can agree with this, Don, read the book, read the rules, understand it. Um, nothing's more frustrating, I think, for a lot of people out there than when you're posed with the question how do i do this and you're like the answer is in front of you yes yes you don't you had the answer in that book the whole time right <laughs> all right my friends well uh with that being said this is uh artichoke dip and the solo rpg guy signing off <laughs>